Right, good uh, morning once again, and I stand between you and lunch, so I promise not to make it too painful. Um, our aim is energy, and we've, uh, in the IEE project, we have worked with the, a lot of sectors in South Africa. We have started to work with foundries, and our work with foundries is not exhaustive, but we're going to share with you some of the, uh, our approach methodology that we apply, and we're going to share with you some of the case studies and some of the work that a colleague and I did in Ghana, on a foundry in Ghana, and some of the lessons we can extract from that for South Africa. So the first two points is just generally to sketch some sort of context. I can't just jump into the door and talk of energy efficiency. We need to look at that in the context of the South African foundry subsector and also the global uh, foundries, where we are, where we are going, what are the trends. And then I want to touch on one last point that Sandy so often says, <coughs> and the repeats in meetings we have in Pretoria is that the importance of foundries to South Africa. And I want to explain that and, and expand on that. And then what I'd like to do is to take you through some of the typical process and energy optimization opportunities that exist in foundries. Some of the auxiliary systems. And then walk you through an assessment we did when we did a pilot project in Ghana and some of the lessons we've learned from that and how that could be applied. And then share with you some case studies if time permits of work done in South Africa. And then finish up with what I consider to be a challenge to the family subsector. And not only to, to you, but to government and to other stakeholders and to banks and to other WFO members. Because this is not a one silver bullet solution. And this is not a one size fits all, very clearly. So when we look at foundry industry, global um, foundry industry trends and challenges, I extracted this from what, a report that they call the 50th uh, consensus uh, median report. And it just gives us an indication of the size of this industry globally. And the top 10 led by China, way and above ahead of the rest of the pack, followed generally by between America and India. Now, if we look at that and we grade that in terms of metric ton output, and out of the top 34 global uh, foundry members, the national members, South Africa sits pretty much in that median of 16 out of the 34. Um, in terms of size, less than 1%, very small. Clearly, China and, and is the dominant factor in all of this, in, uh, Indian America and Japan to a lesser extent following that. When we look at that in terms of number of foundries, then the picture changes slightly, and America is kicked out of their, uh, their, their third position by Japan. And all of a sudden, we find coming into the top ten is Pakistan. So Pakistan must have a lot of small foundries. South Africa, once again, in, that, in, the, in, the, in the range analyzed of 36 foundries, was again filling that median position, about 20 out of the 34. So you can see the scale of the who we need to be working with, who we need to be benchmarking with, and where we need to be learning from. And that was just to provide some input into that. Now, some of the strategic challenges of the global foundry industry highlighted, I believe, impact South Africa too. And I want to touch on just one or two of those elements to go down. In terms of globalization, the major part of the demand growth will occur in emerging markets, will occur in emerging markets. And I hope that South Africa doesn't miss the opportunity that we have missed on our continent with the last, with the, with the economic um, growth we've seen on the African continent. So that says to me that there's an opportunity for the South African uh, foundry sector. In terms of technological leadership, maintaining the technological leadership is a great importance, not only to the Europeans, but let me, based on what Sandy has said and his experience, very much so to South Africa as well. We cannot ignore the value and the importance of that. In terms of retaining qualified personnel, I referred to what Sandy referred to earlier as well, is that many qualified foundry workers will retire during the next few years. What are we doing about making sure we have a succession plan in place, that we have good quality and strong uh, institutions producing the skill sets that we need to grow the this, this sector in terms of investment requirements, growing trend towards completely finished cost parts and will necessitate respective investments. So funding is important. If we're going to upgrade the technology of the South African foundry sector, we're going to need money to do that. So there has to be a relationship with financial institutions in that regard. Margin pressure, we'll see a growing international competition. 
in especially the vehicle manufacturing industry. And here we can't ignore Trumpism and what the Brexit will do to the foundry sector, because it is having an effect already. In terms of industry consolidation, the industry consolidation is expected to continue. What we mean by that is we'll find foundries merge and form larger foundries. We may find foundries, smaller foundries, drop out of the pool eventually. And in summary, the global foundry industry will face rising investment requirements. Together with succession-related problems in mid-sized companies, this might increase industry consolidation. And then as a summary from uh, WFO and, 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 and the publication is really these, these uh, six trends. One is that the global foundry industry is set to profit from strong growth of key customer industries during the next year. That's encouraging. It's encouraging to hear what the professor just said. The independence developed and how, how Egypt weaned themselves of very expensive textile machine parts in Europe and elsewhere in the world through the foundry sector. Asia is expected to outgrow the general market even in the medium to long term. And we see a burgeoning China with a, with a, with a softening national demand that becomes a big danger to other markets in the world. Competitive pressures from other technologies, for example, forging and sheet metal forming is expected to remain strong. However, especially for structural components in light vehicles, we see a trend towards casting technologies. Again, a very reassuring factor. In Europe, we expect higher growth sales for aluminium foundries compared to iron, ductile iron and steel foundries. The profitability is measured by earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization margin globally declined during the last years due to increased pressure on customer industry. That's not good news. So your pressure is going to remain uh, under, uh, under increasing pressure. Your, your margins will remain under increasing pressure. So you're not going to make growing profits. But we want to see a foundry, that, a foundry sector in South Africa that is viable, competitive and sustainable. And during the next years, we forecast an ongoing consolidation process in the global foundering industry. And we've said that a few times. So let us now look at what we've done. And when Sandy gave us a list a few months ago of the number of foundries in South Africa, we started to do cold calls. And we checked up on each and every one of them. And we wanted to meet them. We had a list of the contact names, the owners. And we called them. And we found that over a period spanning 2003 to 2019, that of the 180 odd, and I see it there, I see the WFO report says in, we had 165 in 2015. But from the 180 on that list, we only found 107 families still operating. That's a big drop. But we found other families that weren't on that list. So, I don't have the deep knowledge in your, in your founding sector, but I get the sense, based on what we've done in the IEE project and the founders we've worked with, that today in South Africa, we probably have around 120 founders. What's significant is since 2010, we've lost, and you hear different stories depending who you talk to, but we've probably lost about 1,600 jobs. Yes. When we analyze those founders, we found that Gauteng is by far and large our China in South Africa. The highest concentration of foundries are in Gauteng, much less in KwaZulu Natal, and even less in the Western Cape, and negligible in the rest of the country. So that is where the concentration of foundries in South Africa are. And if we analyze them by the type and nature of work they do, then I see that really jobbing, jobbing and production and production are more or less equal in equivalent numbers. So that is really where the, where the activity, that's the nature, that describes the nature of our foundries. So, just to get a sense of the South African subsector, for 120 founders, we got a lot of role players. We got a lot of attention. We have government through DTI that set up a program just for the sector. So really, there's a lot of attention to what the, the, the DTI DG said, that they focus so much on other things that they actually forgot about the manufacturing process and that there's clearly now almost a resurgence of interest in the foundry sector from government, and particularly the DTI. And that's not a bad thing. These challenges are disconcerting. There's an enormous amount of challenges. Sandy mentioned only a few on his slide. Lack of skills, import leakage, rising energy costs, low competitiveness, poor energy efficiency. I'm not going to read all of them, but they are huge. And they clearly need to be overcome if we're going to make this and render the sector uh, uh, viable. But there are opportunities. 
And I know I've met some founding members who complained about being sidelined and not by being included in this, uh, some of these opportunities. But we have the public infrastructure build programs, we've got the mining turnkey projects, and we've got the localization programs. And then also we've got access to these South African, African, and South American markets. Those must be opportunities, guys. And then there's the threat of this declining ch uh, Chinese demand and the fact that Chinese production may ultimately compete for business. And he's already competing for business in our own country. And um, gaps in terms of accreditation and compliance needs, a huge gap and a huge opportunity to work with NFT in that regard. Product development and innovation. So having said all of that about founders, why are they important? They're important because the modern world functions because we have metal castings. And they're an integral part to virtually all manufacturing activities. And you got some examples from the professor as well. Just to give you an example, in America, castings are used to produce 90% of all manufactured durable goods and nearly all manufactured machinery. It supports an, a payroll of $8 billion. Not, a, not to be sneezed at, a sizable sector in America. Manufacturing sectors are dependent on it for the tools, castings, components, and systems used to operate or build machinery in mining, rail, electricity generation, and other sectors. And after years of relative decline, the re-emergence and importance of the manufacturing industry is gaining momentum worldwide. So what we are saying is we have a challenged foundry sector, but there are opportunities, and the good news is that there's a re-emergence re of the importance of this. And there's a need. We can't do without the sector. So we need to find ways to develop this into a viable and sustainable sector. And now I want to just refocus and talk about some, what I see as process efficiency and energy efficiency opportunities. And that's a terrible looking distorted pie chart, but bear with me. What I want to say to you is that the kilowatt hour per ton metric, the kilowatt hour per ton of product cost is influenced by the metal losses in the process and is a good measure of process efficiency. And also, in some cases, could be considered a measure of energy efficiency, although we'll have a big fight about that one day. But if we look at just the metal flowing into a casting on that terrible graph, then you find that there's only a heel of 59% and those are our losses. So let's examine some of those losses. There's the melt losses, known as slag or dross due to oxidization of the metal. Unfortunately, it may be small, but unfortunately, it's the biggest cost loss because it's irrecoverable. Now, you can reduce it, and you can look at developing uh, technologies and ways of reducing that through improved furnace seals, reducing the air fuel ratio in the furnace, or vortex feeds. Then we have planned recovery losses, where the, we have to remelt first time through metal because it not, it's not, was not done to spec. It was intended just a test. And, we were, we were testing it out. Those have to be remounted, and that's wasted energy. And then we have unplanned recovery losses, and those happen. They are normal. They, they're normal operational losses. They are the little splashes and the spills. And when you have cost what you had to cost, you order, you may have some excess metal left. That has to be reheated. That, once again, is a wasted energy. And then you have scrap. Scrap resulting from inaccurate machining, cracks in your finished products or incorrect metallurgical properties, or even customer returns. Those have to be remelted. Again, energy wasting. So really what that says to us, if we add up these here, that there are 41% that doesn't go through first time. So really we almost have to reheat everything twice before, or double the amount to produce what we need to achieve. And except for that 2% that's not recoverable, that could be recoverable, but at the cost of a lot of more energy. And therein lies an opportunity. And what we are saying to foundry members and foundry uh, men is take time to manage and improve your melt loss performance, your recovery losses, your scrap rates, so that you can ultimately improve your kilowatt hours per ton and as a result of that, improve your process efficiency. And as a result of that, maybe your energy efficiency as well. So let's talk about the auxiliaries. It's not only about furnaces. There are other machines in and around the foundry. There are motors and drives. The motors and drives don't drive nothing. They drive something. They drive a pump. They drive a fan, a compressor, a conveyor. 
So the selection of the motor, the type of motor, the size of motor, motor oversizing is a big iniquity in industry. We see a lot of that. The selection of the driver, direct or line, the soft start, start out, the oil DFD drive, the consideration of the, of the motor selection, the rating, the size, the type of motor for those high start of torques and high start of currents. Consider the impact of voltage imbalances and that, that, that has on motor D ratings. High efficiency motors, do you only operate on what you have and what's available or do you actually specify you want an IE4, IE3, a minimum IE3? Do you have that specification? <coughs> motor management policy. Do you have a policy in your plant that says, I will only rewind motors above 20 kilowatts and I will only rewind the motor three times before I replace it. And all motors that fail below 20 kilowatts are replaced and won't rewind. That's an important policy to have because ultimately you're giving some direction to your operations, uh, to your procurement staff, you know what you're doing and you are able to validate and test the efficacy of that policy from time to time. Power factor, power factor correction. I thought in South Africa, industry was pretty good at that. I'm wrong. You know, I went to Ghana and thought that they were bad. I came back here and found equally bad South African companies in terms of power factor. You are paying for electricity you're not using or you're not utilizing. Mm -hmm. So power factor correction becomes quite a big opportunity to improve. It's not an energy efficiency performance, but it's clearly the business imperative. Compressed air system. <coughs> And in a lot of the, in the few of the work we've done with founders in South Africa, compressed air systems was almost next to optimization of the furnace. Compressed air systems was something that was optimized. The sizing and selection of your air treatment, that's a common fallacy. People undersize their, their dryers or their air treatment, their filters. Because the salesmen don't know how to do it and they don't know how to do it. Pressure profiles and pressure drops. What is the pressure you're getting at the furthest point from your compressor? And what is your pressure profile? Look at it. Where are you losing pressure? Understand that and start to curtail that so that you move your pressure profile to where it should be. The control gap. When you need more air and your compressor you're using is too small but the next one's too big. That's the little gap that we talk about. And in terms of clever controls and clever sizing of equipment, you can overcome those issues. And we work with that within the IE project. Header and distribution sizing and air velocities. Consideration need to be given that that is quite an important factor. The kind of air velocities in main headers and in distribution headers and what it should be and what the causes of excessive velocities are leading to the kind of pressure profile drops I spoke about earlier. Inappropriate use of compressed air. We see this so often. Cooling a bed and cooling a hot pipe or even sweeping the floor or just cleaning yourself. Inappropriate. Absolutely bad. Compressed air is one of the most expensive sources of secondary energy. Rather go buy yourself an electric blower if you want to, but don't use your compressor for that. Mm -hmm. um, the use and sizing of wet and, wet and dry receivers is an art in, of itself, knowing how to size it properly. Mm -hmm. Then we have where there are steam systems, it's looking at the combustion controls, whether we apply to ensure that we have the correct air fuel or oxygen fuel ratios. And there you could have a positional or you could have an automatic twin control. You want to look at the automatic blowdown control so that you don't blow down for the sake of blowing, blowing down a predetermined period, losing valuable heat and thermal energy in doing that. Water chemistry and the aerators. Feed water economizes on your stacks to capture that heat that you spent a lot of money in fuel to heat before expelling it into the atmosphere. Insulation losses, wherever they occur, to quantify them and to determine whether it's necessary to do it immediately or whether it can wait until the next breakdown. Compensate recovery, making sure that there's much, if you're especially if you're working with heat exchanges and you're not doing any direct injection, is that you recover that condensate because it's the purest form of water and you're getting it back into your boiler at a thermal level and a potential value that you won't get from the municipal or borehole lines. Leak and trap management plans are equally important. Other areas would be space heating, and the consideration in space heating would be what is your heat selection? What are the controls and maintenance for that? And in terms of lighting, are you harvesting your daylight? Are you looking at localized lighting instead of general lighting? And what, have you considered your lamp selection? So those are the things, the, the energy efficiency elements within auxiliaries that can contribute to your energy performance in your farm. Now, I have a colleague in the room, Siraj Williams, and I want to I acknowledge him because he worked on this project with me and he was directly responsible for a lot of the work I'm going to show you now is that we started in Ghana and we were looked at 
all we found is we, we ignored the aluminium ones and we, we, we sampled, we surveyed eight and we got responses from four. And then we evaluated those for over 26 different criteria. There's just some of them. We looked at them in terms of the process technology, the plant age, the site load, the voltage, the annual cons energy consumption, the annual scrap consumption, the annual production in terms of tons, um, what their kilowatt hour per ton was, and what their, their yield was in terms of scrap uh, as a percentage of production, power factor in those, what were the finished products, how many workers they had. So I'm sharing that with you, and that was what we started. We then took that and we analyzed that and we, and we weighted that, and we developed what we call an optimization rating. And the optimization rating indicates to us which of those four was the ideal plant to, to use as our, as our demonstration pilot plant. Because it presented the right management culture, it presented the best and the lower hanging fruit. And what we then went ahead is we, we applied the methodology in the, in the IEE project, which was we took a systems approach. We don't look at a motor. We don't look at a furnace on its own. We don't look at a fan or a pump on its own. We look at the fan system. We look at the process that demands the, the service provided by the energy component. So we took the systems approach. We also developed a baseline. So when we went there in April, we looked, looked at the previous 12-month period. We had good data, and we started to test the data. We developed relevant variables, and we developed a baseline. And we also developed an energy performance indicator, that little thing there. Because if we are going to measure how they're doing, we need to know what the ENPI is. It was also important for us to know which are the significant energy users in the plant. So we don't waste our time looking at something that really isn't important to the owners of the business. And what we took along was a range of equipment. And you'll notice in that, what predominantly power quality analyzers was power data loggers and it was thermal imaging cameras. Because that's what we needed to do in this plant. We needed to capture how they were using the power. And it was a process that essentially so a lot of scrap through a magnetic uh, hoist being fed into furnaces, induction furnaces, into a continuous casting machine, a rolling mill, and ultimately the finished rebar there. But we had a little side uh, process where from the bullet inventory we had a reheat furnace showing up with that same process. And when we started to analyze it, that first graph over there, production versus output, we started to look at, uh, was it input, what? Scrap comes in and what goes out. Now, if you remember the losses I shared with you earlier where I said melt losses should be around 2% due to oxidization, hey, that's almost like 90%. So there's a huge opportunity there. That's different between the blue and the, the yellow trend line. So that already started to say to us we need to look at that. We then looked at the energy consumption in relation to production, uh, production and we could already see a correlation between electricity consumption and the production of rebar. So that said to us that we knew, we had zeroed in, we knew what the driver was. And in terms of SEUs, it was no doubt that the furnaces were by far the biggest, 82%, then the rolling mill, and then there was the auxiliaries. And what this business had, they were recording their data manually. People, they didn't have a laptop. They had a book, a full scrap book, where they were recording it with the greatest love and passion and some of the best handwriting I've seen. They had all the information for every single heat, all the components that went into it, the times, everything was there. They just didn't have it in an order that they could analyze it. And what Saraj did, he started to help them to inform the information in a manner that started to talk to them. And all of a sudden, we could start to see sorry, production, the electricity consumption, we could start to see performance ratios. And we started to get a sense of the performance of the plant. And to them, they started to see it for the first time. And that in and of itself was a wonderful opportunity for them as well. Our baseline showed that for the period before we came there, April 2018, we developed the baseline with a pretty good R squared of 0.972. And it was no doubt that bullets produced was the biggest driver of energy consumption in that place. And when we look at some of the losses, the typical losses for the type of um, induction furnaces that they operate, and I believe they weren't even achieving anywhere used to the, near the useful energy of 62 to 75 percent. A lot of that was coil losses over here, but we needed to get an understanding of where the losses were. And one of the things we did when we started to download the data that we logged, we were able to determine the heats. And the, the area in red is the heat. 
But within each heat, as the scrap mag picks up and puts the scrap into the induction furnace, we had what we called idle periods. And we couldn't believe that a plant the size was having an idle period over lunch and tea time. So that was one of the first things that we wanted to stop, is have your shifts overlap, but don't stop your work during lunch and tea time. We also found, interestingly, when we compared it over a period of time, that at night shift, the idle times were longer, because there were no managers at night shift. And that needed some attention. So we started to highlight things that I think they suspected, but they couldn't prove. We started to point out to them areas for, for improvement, and, and it became clear in our discussion during the feedback that they had started to zero in on what was essentially the, 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 maybe the silver bullet, silver bullet in their business, which was to reduce the time between each of these to make sure that, and they, they fixed up their, their crane, it was to reduce the time between the loads of the scrap into the induction furnace and reduce the period of the heat. So reduce the amount of energy you consume, and improving your energy efficiency that way. And then we looked at the large fan, and they had a very large pollution fan, 220 kW fan, and, we, and it was damper controlled at the time. And you looked at the losses, that's power, and over a period of time, you look at the power profiles, and it was clear to us that here's another big opportunity waiting to happen. And if we could slow down this fan, or change the frequency of this fan, as and when the demand slowed down, or when there when we were only one out of four of the furnaces running, we could save them a lot of energy instead of the damper control they had. And in summary, these were the projects we ultimately tabled. And the SEBI, by the way, is stronger than around about three or even four times. But if you look at the project, sorting of scrap, you know, lids for the furnaces, optimizing charging practices, automated bullet cutting or, uh, cutting or VFD, but they were doing that manually. The poor man was sitting with his mask on at probably temperatures approaching 90 degrees and, and, and with the torch cutting the, the, the bullets. And then DFD for the main pollution fans. So we identified opportunities that would stay them just under five gigawatt hours. It would cost them 2.8 million cities and they uh, they, uh, it will cost them 6.4 and they, and they would save in terms of, they'd have a payback of 2.3 years. And so the <coughs> yeah, so 2.3 years. And when we went back to share this with them, we discovered that they didn't wait for us. They started to do some of the things themselves. And when we did a post baseline analysis, we discovered that from the four periods, May, June, July, August, after the baseline period, we started to see an improvement in the savings, applying a regression analysis to, to validate it, of 570,000 kilowatt hours in four months by simply starting to apply what we had said. So there's an example of what can be achieved. I'll run through these very quickly. This is what we did in South Africa, GNW-based minerals. The projects here were Mold 6 optimization, there was a lab furnace optimization, and again, compressed air system. And there the savings was very small, but it was savings. 41 with a 2 year thing. Nobody's going to give you that for nothing. Then we had a bigger one, it was Arsenal Mittal Sildana. They had a, a pump farm. We just looked at one of the systems. Uh, they had 10 systems on that pump farm. We took system one, and system one had eight uh, pumps. Uh, currently, six were running and two were on standby. They were 280 kW, 3.3 uh, kilowatts. 3.3 kBs uh, with a head of 66. The process requirements and the takeover point was 6,500 kilometers <coughs> per hour uh, at a pressure of 750 kPa. So we needed to maintain that. And we got on there, and they had a, the return from the, that was supplying uh, wa water, colder water, to the Connacht furnace and went into the Maric valves, into the Connacht furnace to cool it off. And it came back, and on its return, it was cooled by a fin fan system, and then back into the pump system. And one of the first things we started to do, we started to map the, the uh, pump curves for each of those eight pumps. And we discovered that one of the pumps had an oversized impeller. We also found that the way they were controlling it was essentially through the control room of the MCC. They would simply look at the current draw, and then they would throttle the discharge. So we set about doing it a bit differently. We put in our own, they replaced all the pressure gauges for us after the first day. 
We monitored, we, first of all, we took this manager who had never done it before, and we went to introduce him to the, um, to the, the furnace manager, the, the hot mill manager, and we got them to speak to each other, to understand what the needs are. So it wasn't what they thought. And that started to change the parameters at the takeover, take, uh, takeover point. And we monitored the takeover point flow and temperature. We were in the MCC and we monitored the control room. And we started to change the throttle settings on the discharge, monitoring all of those at the same time that we were supplying the melt shop what they wanted. We were able, as a result of that, to switch up another pump. It cost them so much. It saved them so much. And I can remember going back to this plant to the, for a management meeting a few months later, and Albert Ricketts, who was the water treatment plant manager, came to me very excitedly, and he said, you know, Alf, I couldn't do it immediately because we had production pressures, and I couldn't chance it. I had to get my production out. But the minute we had achieved production for that month, I turned that pump off, and I did what you guys said. And he said, man, I'm now saving 1.1 million rand a year. This was another study at Van der Veil Park. We had the blast furnace cooling tower water. The same thing there, they were running, we got them to run one pump less and more efficiently at a lower head, achieved by reducing system friction due to improving both suction and discharge conditions. Here, yeah, they saved uh, 1.9 million kilowatt hours. Uh, that was the monthly saving. It cost them 667,000 rand, a payback in 5.5 months. They achieved that. So, my last slide. I think the message is clear. Energy efficiency is not going to save the foundry sector on its own, but it's an important factor. And I think it's something that we really want to work with the foundry sector in, in terms of the NCPC and the IEE project and NFTN. So let us work with you. But there are other elements that are equally important. It's not only about skills and implementation services. It's about those investments, and it's about those policies and institutions. And we need to see these three cogs work together and synchronous and in harmony. And this was a really a, a take out from a study done by the IFC, the International Finance Corporation in 2012, where they looked at a foundry in Russia, they looked at a foundry in Germany. And the foundry in Russia, in terms of overhead cost, raw material cost, was about a third of that of the German. But the Russians were delivering steel onto the world markets at almost this, just 4% cheaper than the Germans, despite that advantages. And they, they weren't, and their quality was much poorer than the German steel quality. But they weren't using that, that lower cost, uh, lower energy cost, lower labor cost, lower over cost to the benefit because of constrained rationality management, pressure that creep in, that, that, that result in poor management decisions. And in analyzing that, it became clear that we could take a Russian foundry to where the German foundry was through some, through some capital investment in newer technologies, no doubt, but 57% of that is resource savings. 57% of taking an average efficiency foundry to a best performance foundry can be extracted from energy performance improvements. And I want to leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.